Next up, we have Peter Dolak. He's going to be talking about data modeling and data validation. If you'd like to ask questions, as you know, you can, you can use Slido, and we're really, really looking forward to this talk. Welcome, Peter. Hi, so I'm Peter from, from Bloomridge. And which of you guys are familiar with a subreddit called Programmer Humor? Hands up. Yeah, quite a lot of you. It is quite popular, and occasionally it's even quite funny. And not always. So maybe you have seen this stuff on there. Um, basically, it tries to give you some true description of programming languages. You don't have to squint your eyes. I'll go through them in a minute. So what does it say about our beloved Python? What if everything was a dict? Well, that's not nice to say. Maybe others. Java, what if everything was an object? JavaScript, what if everything was a dict and an object? C, what if everything was a pointer? C++, what if we added everything to the language? C++11, what if we forgot to stop adding stuff? Perl, what if shell, set, and awk were one language? <laughs> Perl 6, what if we took the joke too far? And PHP, what if we wanted to make XCL injection easier? <laughs> yeah, okay, so some of these are quite funny. Unfortunately, even more of these are true. <laughs> So is it true that we tend to overuse dictionaries in Python? Well, sometimes, maybe. An alternate name for my talk could be, what if everything wasn't a dict? So this is an example of some code that I uh, wrote just for this talk. Don't worry, it's not actually in our production, and it's dumb on purpose. And uh, maybe you yourself once find yourself writing code like this after an especially bad night. Why is it bad? Well, it's basically a flask view which deserializes some data from JSON. And then, basically, when it tries to process this data, it will just use dictionary lookup to see these items. So what is so wrong with it? Well, for example, the structure of this data is very mysterious. I put this example of some data that might come to it here. If you didn't have that, you would have no idea what the data actually looks like. Also, it is, doesn't have any typing, so you have no type safety, and you know, for example, you have no idea if what you, you're putting here, which should be a string, is actually a string. And then there is some attempt to validate this data, but as you can see, it's very you know, basic, and it, it is missing a lot of issues that the data may have. So for example, these items might be missing here, or maybe uh, this is not a string, it's an integer, Maybe, so you, you could also have a key error, you could have a type error, for example, when try, trying to iterate this. Maybe there's some attribute error in there, I don't know. So generally, code like this is quite clumsy and you shouldn't write it like this. So what better options do we have in the standard library? Well, aside from this, which you know, I named why it's so, so bad, you could write some class which try to, tries to model this data, basically a class for every dictionary uh, within the data. And this is fine, you can write some types in there and have at least that, but you will have to write a lot of boilerplate code in order to initialize these classes, in order to validate them. You can encapsulate a validation in there, but it will be still a lot of code that is, and it's easy to just forget to validate something like that. And plus, programmers, we are lazy and we are right to be so. We just don't want to write boilerplate code that can be avoided. So one of the things that can help you with this is data classes. Uh, data classes uh, will basically write some of these methods for you, like init. Um, an issue with data classes is that, for example, if we have some data like this, uh, which has a dictionary or a model within another field, it won't be initialized by itself, by data classes. You have to do all this stuff yourself, and then data classes, of course, have no support for validation. They, in fact, don't even validate whether the data you have supplied in those fields have the right types. So are, is there anything better we can do? Well, you can use some library. And I don't actually know what these libraries are called. I'm, I'm going to call them data models, but it's probably wrong. I've heard people refer to them as input data structures, data validation libraries, advanced data classes, so, yeah, something like that. So when these are not, not appropriate, mainly if you are already using something like Django or uh, SQL Alchemy, which models your data uh, with these libraries because it's actually mapping to some relational database. So in that case, you're, you're good. But 
maybe you are writing some code that works with a database like MongoDB or Bigtable, which maybe don't have the best libraries for that, and that's ideal for this. So you can initialize the data that's coming from your da database, database into these uh, advanced data classes, let's say. You can also work with some complex definitions that either come from a user or from the database or configuration structures. Maybe you're trying to actually validate user inputs as well as possible. And maybe you just want to write classes and avoid some boilerplate code like data, class, data classes do. So in my company, Bloomreach, uh, we were previously known as Exponia. Over nine years ago, before I even joined the company, a year before, we chose to use a library called Schematics. Is there anyone familiar with this library, Schematics? Not a lot of you. That's surprising, and I think it's good, <laughs> because it sucks. <laughs> and um, you can see how it is being used. So basically, here you can see some classes that you might have written yourself, giving them some typings. And um, then you are defining some kind of a descriptor for each field, which will say what type it is, whether the field is required, what defaults does it have, maybe even some basic validation. And uh, the way schematics works, you can actually initialize them with the data like this. So you just take the JSON, which is some dict with some list and stuff like that, and you just initialize it and you get a nice instance or a structure of instances of these classes. So that's all good. Then you can also validate this data. This may raise some validation error, which you can handle. Schematics will also actually give you multiple validation error from one request, so you can just report them all, or maybe just the first one if you so desire. And uh, you can just access the items uh, using, you know, as an attribute, so which is nicer. And you, if you actually supply types here, in schematics they're optional, or rather schematics doesn't care about them, uh, then your code actually will be type safe. You know, you can use a type checker. So that's relatively good. And if anyone here is considering using a library like this, please don't use schematics because it's just not very good. Uh, so what are the problems with it? First of and foremost, it's performance. Um, we recently found out that in Bloomreach's uh, Python services, schematics is often taking 10 to 30% of CPU cycles, which is horrible. That's like truly awful. Like I don't want a third party library to take up all of that CPU time. I want my suboptimal sub application code to take up that useless CPU time. And it also isn't great for memory. It actually will take up to three times more memory than if you, if you were just using raw dicts and lists and stuff like that. Uh, then, as I said, there is no native support for typing, so you can add them, but schematics is not able to benefit from them at all. And um, you also, if you have a lot of these classes, like in Bloomreach we have actually over a thousand of these schematics models, then, and you actually are importing all of them when your applications, for example, a Flask web server is starting up, this will take quite a lot of time. It can even take two plus seconds, which is nasty. For example, if you're just want to, wanting to run one test and I just think that schematics doesn't have the best user experience for many of the reasons I mentioned and some I didn't. So I decided maybe a year ago that I wanted to find a replacement or maybe not find one because, um, you know, the schematics was, it was just too slow considering the stuff it was doing. It wasn't actually that difficult and we needed a better library, so I just said, how hard can it be to just not search for one, to write on my own? Because yeah, why would you spend some three boring minutes searching for a better library, existing library, when you can spend three exciting weekends writing your own, right? Right? Okay. Well, I don't know if it actually took three weeks to write Stereotype, which is the name of my library, but I know I spent at least uh, a quarter of that time just thinking up a good name. Naming is indeed the most difficult problem in programming. So let's see it. Uh, you can find it here on GitHub. I'll post a QR, co QR code later. And basically, just like in schematics, you will also be defining some fields and some models. Basically, the models are um, modeling dictionaries within your data, at least the ones that have a you know, rigid structure, and the fields are defined uh, modeling their keys. 
And then when you want to uh, define a field, which is of type string, you just do you know, type string just like in data classes. And this will be a required field that has no default. And it cannot be none, because obviously there is no none in the typing. If you want to give it a default, just like equals default, like, just like in data classes, and if you want to specify some advanced options, then you can uh, use a class like, you know, a field class like in field, and then specify some minimum value, maximum value, stuff like that. Uh, you can also use, of course, models recursively. So I can have a list of these models. And um, you can even specify a default, like an empty list, because you know the library is smart enough to realize that you probably don't want the same list shared across all your instances that have a default. And you can also pass some custom validators, and you can have optional fields that can be none, and all that good stuff. So, yeah, the basic usage is very similar to schematics. So basically, this code, if you were using a stereotype model, would work almost the same, just a different exception, maybe a nicer one. Okay, so let's talk about some features that I added. You can see these on the GitHub, but I'll just go through them quickly. Currently, it, have, it has all the field types that are supported in JSON. I didn't bother adding much more, but I probably will later. So like you can have bools, you know, lists, dicks, anything. Um, then you can also use other models, even recursively. So you know, one model can use itself as a field as many times as you wish, probably not infinite times. Then you can have dynamic model fields, so it can be a union that will, and stereotype will determine which of the, the classes in the union you actually wanted to use ba based on some key uh, called type in the field, which is just some string that discriminates it. I even included a schematics model adapter because the library was basically written to, for us to replace schematics with it, and you, you probably don't want to do it in like one huge commit. And you can also define your custom fields. And for validation, um, there are some basic validation options like you saw, for example, like min, max value, length, choices for string, regex, regex, and stuff like that. You can even define custom validation with some uh, field-bound callbacks or some instance-bound validator methods. And aside from you know, uh, that, you can also validate stuff without, con sorry, convert stuff without validating it. So you would have a separate validation call, and if you're, for example, are, are receiving your data from a database, and you know it's safe, you don't need to validate it, you can skip all of that. And it will also report all the validation errors with their paths, so for example, you can write some front-end that will localize all the errors that are received from back-end to the actual fields where the error was. It also has some like calculated serializable fields. You can adjust the names, both in input and output, hide zero values, and blacklist some fields based on roles. Okay, what are the alternatives? Because I'm not claiming that my library is the best. So who here is familiar with Pydentic? Yeah, me, more of you than for schematics. Um, the answer is probably depends which one of these is better. I'm just convinced that um, Stereotype is better for our use case. So Pydentic is very feature-rich. Um, it has built-in types for probably just about any type you can encounter in Python. And it has some very nice features, um, stuff that you can do with models. For example, you can generate documentation. Your Pydentic is the base for fast API, which uh, someone will talk about later today. It also has some amazing support for type checking, even better than stereotype, I must, I must admit. It has even plugins that you can use in your favorite um, type checker or uh, ID that will allow you to check types even more thoroughly than Python could do by itself with just using the type in, typing library. Some disadvantages is that if you have some data that is already trusted and you don't need to validate it, you cannot skip validation in Pydantic. I've been looking for that. I only found this construct class method but that's not recursive, so it will only initialize one model. If you have uh, you know, some other model as a field, that will remain a dict. So it's not really useful for much, except for really simple models. And also I think the way uh, Pydentic will offer you to do validation is somewhat clumsy. 
you either, you basically just have to use some weird class method, which I think will just easily break during any refactoring, and you don't have these like easy options to validate some common stuff, like you know minimum value for some number. Although you, it has a lot of types which uh, have some basic validation, but you know I don't think it's that great. Uh, attributes, uh, or actually, who, who, which one of you is using this library? Okay, so do you know what it's actually pronounced? <laughs> how it's pronounced, because I have no idea, maybe it's ATTRs, maybe it's Atters, I don't know. But this is a library with a simple premise, it basically says that it will only add some double under or uh, dunder methods, like init and stuff like that, and won't mess up your namespace in your class with some other methods, and you have some like helper functions, for example, to serialize the data and stuff like that. It has insanely good performance, but conversion of fields is very hands-on, you basically have to write the conversion, if, if you want the field to convert uh, or basically just ensure uh, type, sorry, a field is an integer, you have to include like a specific call to, to the int call. So it's, it's not, not that great. It's kind of hands-on and um, it also cannot really uh, disable the validation. It can only do so globally, but you know, if, if you need to disable validation only for like one call, then you're out of luck. Okay, so let's see some benchmarks. I just included a quick slide regarding the setup. So if you're interested, here's what the data looks like. This is a function that generates them with dep4. And it has some short string, bulls, lenses, stuff like that. And it will convert the data, try to validate it, if validation isn't even supported, and then convert it back to the raw dicts. So let's see some benchmarks. As you can see, I use data classes as some baseline for the benchmarks. Whoa, that's slow. Yeah. Uh, schematics is slow, slow. How slow is it that I managed to write uh, my entire library just while, while this benchmark was running? <laughs> yeah, not really, but it is, it is slow enough to make all the other libraries basically be too, like these bars are just too tiny to tell you anything meaningful. So I'll just hide schematics and let the, you know, change the maximum on this. Yes, infinity. <laughs> so as you can see, um, schematics is super slow. Pydentic is a lot better. It is actually only just about twice as uh, slow as uh, data classes, even though it is doing a lot more than data classes do, including the validation. I'm not including uh, some data from conversion because it cannot do that. Then ATTRs, as I said, are crazy good in performance. They do have like this global field, that global stuff that you can disable the validation everywhere. It won't even help much unless your validation is super expensive. And so what about my library stereotype? Well, eh, maybe it's a little bit faster, especially if you're not doing validation, then you can squeeze more performance out of it than attributes, but as you can see, if you are, are doing validation, it is a little bit slower. But we'll come back to the CPU benchmarks. I still have one trick up my sleeve. As for memory, um, this benchmark kind of over-exaggerates this because the data has like really uh, small strings, which are not just really realistic for real-world data. So here we have like 11 kilobytes of JSON that take maybe, I don't know, 60 kilobytes when converted to dicts and lists when deserialized. Data classes will actually even do a little bit better, funny. Then schematics is of course the worst. <laughs> and then Pydentic is a little bit better, just about two times uh, as big as, you know, if you had just the raw data. And then attributes and stereotype are so much better than even the raw data. How is this possible that it is able to use less memory than if you just stored it as dicts and lists? Some of you might know it's because of slots. Are you familiar with slots? I don't think I'm going to preach to the choir here too much, but actually not many of you. So slots are something that can help you save some memory and even some CPU by defining what attributes your class is allowed to have. And when Python has this information, it can use an internal tuple to store the attribute values in your class instance instead of using an internal dict. And obviously a hash map, a dictionary, is just not uh, the most memory efficient, even though it's great in Python. 
and it will also speed up the initialization time because it is much easier to initialize a tuple and it requires fewer allocations than to initialize a Python dict. And also it has slightly faster attributes access so you, you will even save some CPU there. But it is kind of cumbersome to include this slots declaration in your classes when just, you know, the compiler knows which fields you are using if you're doing a model like, like I showed you previously. So stereotype and even a bunch of other libraries, for example, attributes or atters will do that too. And you even have some libraries that just do this one thing. It will auto slot the class for you. And basically you just, you just in stereotype, you just write your class and it's automatically auto slotted. You can disable this if you don't want it because it has some issues with multiple inheritance in some cases, but it will give you this uh, nice benefit. I actually did some benchmarks and found out that thanks to slots, the classes were taking only a half of memory and even CPU increased a bit. Okay. Um, another thing that Stereotype does, which you know, I wouldn't say it pushes Python to the limits, that's just clickbait to get you in here, but um, it's kind of interesting, is that it parses the type annotations at runtime in order to know what fields your class should, what fields your classes should have. And it uses a couple of functions within the py ty typing module. Get type hints will actually, uh, you will take a class and give you what type hints you have defined. Then you can use uh, get origin to parse some complex typing, like for example, for the list and get args to get, you know, the things that are the arguments to the list and dictionary typing hints. So this is cool and it allows you to say writing some code. You don't have to specify the type uh, you know, with some field class in stereotype. If you, if you only are using the basic options, basically if you're satisfied that the field has no default and is required cannot be none. Okay, so maybe some general tips before we dive in more into performance. Um, avoid deep copy. It's the main reason why schematics is so slow because deep copy is just way too complex to be efficient. Simpler is often better, so avoid trying uh, adding many features that you don't know if you will need if you want to keep your code performant. Then just this simple, stupid thing, this is faster than this. And try to delay allocations of, for example, an empty list unless you are actually sure that you need to use the list. Don't create objects that should just to throw them away. And another thing you can do is try to avoid some repetitive work. So for example, in this case, we have a list comprehension, which is trying to convert some items with some, you know, uh, convert function that is the method that ha includes two attribute accesses. But these attributes accesses are same for every iteration. So yeah, just ex extract them outside. And this will actually make this code two times faster, which is really a big deal, if uh, convert has no overhead, if it's just a no op. So this is simple. Let's take it a bit further. Uh, this is an example of code that uh, does the initialization. It's very simplified, but basically in every instantiation of a model, it will try to do a lot of these attributes accesses to uh, extract some metadata about the fields, right? And all of these will cost you some TPU performance, these attribute accesses. So, you know, the, you are only running this code once when initializing a class. So it, there is no, you know, you cannot extract it to a local variable that won't help you. But you can only do this attribute access during the initialization of the model class, which is done only once in your program's lifetime. And basically what I did was do this attribute accesses just once and then store them in a tuple. And tuple unpacking in Python into some local variables like this is super fast, so that's great. And then you just have to use these local variables and this also improved the performance drastically. There is still one more thing you can do because um, for example, here I'm asking about something that is, you know, some meta information about a specific field. But I don't want Python to, every time when it's initializing this field, to check this attribute, which, you know, it should just know that it's, uh, like, it doesn't allow a primitive name, so it shouldn't serialize and stuff like that. How can you force Python to do this? Well, it turns out, and I hold to your seats, Python is an interpreted language. Oh, okay, I guess you know that. But that means you can actually compile code during runtime. And you can generate some stuff that will make your, basically at runtime you will generate code that knows exactly how to run 
do the things you need in the fastest way possible, and then just you use a trick like this to extract this generated function, which is just then, then a normal uh, Python function, and run this instead of some code you, that would be more complex. So how about the benchmark? Yes, it's finally faster than attributes. Nice. OK, that's what I have. Time for your questions. If you guys want to use this library or just check it out, maybe just scan this QR code or go to the link and maybe give it a star so that you don't forget. And now I have time for your questions. Thank you. So I already closed a couple of questions because you already addressed them. So comparison to Pydentic and, and adders. Uh, what about daytime support? Yeah, that's something that we even actually did in our like closed source repository, which is using Stereotype right now. I will probably put it into uh, Stereotype and even a lot more types, just, you know, time is short. <laughs> I uh, only have so many weekends. <laughs> Uh, what about the uh, benchmark methodology? Yeah, so uh, for these benchmarks, I show you what data I was using. Uh, that's so far down there. Yep. And I was basically running it uh, thousands, maybe ten thousands of times to just fill up some time. And I don't know, maybe you, you could specify what exactly you're talking about because I don't want to be, you know, talking about too simple stuff in benchmarking. Maybe that's something to take the whole way track, right? And discuss. Uh, maybe that's something to discuss after the talk. Uh, if yeah, uh, sure. whoever asked the question, uh, feel free uh, to approach Peter. And uh, nice talk. Have you considered implementing the core of the library in another language, such as C or Rust, for performance? This is actually something that I think uh, the attributes library can do. It has some C extension called C attributes or C adders. And no, I haven't considered it because I just wanted a library that you can just plug in and use without uh, having to even download a wheel. But it is possible, not sure if it's worth it because it's already quite fast. And my goal was just writing something that's faster than schematics and it's like 10 times faster for conversion and without the g generation uh, hack and up to 40 times faster with validation. So good enough for me. That was our last question. Big thanks to Peter Dulak. Mikrobit je programovateľný milý počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem, alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty?
Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.